Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a challenge video but it kind of has elements of tag about it. So this is called the 25 book challenge and it has two aspects to it. You request five prompts from a fellow Booktuber who's done the tag, hence that I think that's the, well, done the challenge I should say, and that's the tag element. Um, and in this case, I asked the prompts from Cena at um, Beating Around the Books. And you have two minutes to supply five books to match each tag. And I say supply, I mean just say, you know, the book name and the, the author. And you have to do that in two minutes, uh, which is a bit of a, a challenge. And uh, then you could take your time and talk about five of the books that you mentioned uh, at sort of slightly greater length. So that is the nature of the challenge stroke tag. So thanks to Zena for providing me with the tags. I first saw this challenge done on uh, Scott and Nell's channel, Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. Uh, and then Zena mentioned it to me on a Voxer chat we were having, but I don't know who originated it. So if it was Scott and Nell, apologies, uh, but I've shouted your name out. If it's someone else, I don't know. So um, I think the easiest way to do this is for me to fixate on my computer clock to time two minutes. So we're going to go uh, mobile. So uh, hopefully that's in focus and you can see my clock when it goes to 10.59. Sorry, 10.59, uh, 4.59. Um, then I will... Oh, this is interesting. Uh, booktube viewing, isn't it? I'm going to edit this. There we go. So, prop one. Books with two-word title. Uh, Nova Express, uh, The Trial, uh, The Castle, um, Little Scratch, uh, um, I'll come back to that. Uh, five books with unconventional themes on narrative techniques. Um, the Age of Wire and String by um, Ben Marcus. This is not a novel and other novels by David Markson. Um, House of Leeds by Mark Danieluski. Uh, the Unfortunates by B.S. Johnson. And Little Scratch by Rebecca Watson. Five books that made you laugh. Uh, Steve Tessick, Carew, um, Steve Tolt's Fraction of the Whole, I Hate the Internet by Jared Kobeck. I'm really enjoying Finding Funny, The Recognitions by William Gaddis, I'm currently reading. One more, one more. Oh, Philip Roth, The Great American Novel. Uh, five books with film adaptations, brackets, you don't have to like them. I don't like them. Um, the, the book that was called Unfilmable and Proved Thus to Be, um, Tristram Shandy. Uh, which was made into a film called Cock and Ball. Same thing with William Burroughs' Naked Lunch, um, Life of Pi, Atonement, and um, Under the Skin by uh, Michel Faber. Five books set in a time you'd like to visit. Well, there is no time I'd like to visit, so I'm just going to talk about books set in future times. Solaris by Yanis um, Stanislaw Lem, Embassy Town by China Mielville. Uh, XX by Rianne Hughes, which is only just in future time. Um, and I would, certainly wouldn't like to visit it because it's set in Hoxton, which is hipster land in London. Uh, two more future books. Um, God. Uh, Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Um, one more novel. Science fiction novel. Um, oh. His Master's Voice, also by Stanislaw Lem. So I need to get one more book with two-word title. Um, did I say Dark Angel by Una Kazern? Ah, so it's 17.01, so it's taken two minutes, but presumably plus, because it didn't just turn over, but I got close. OK, so I've edited down my two-minute challenge, because I was intrigued to see how long it took me, and I was 22 seconds over two minutes which initially I sort of congratulated myself on on a very uh, noble effort. Uh, but then I realised that Utica Zern's novel was not called Dark Angel, it was called Dark Spring. So in fact it was an epic fail because I didn't supply five uh, books with um, two name titles, which is really annoying because some of my favourite books have two two word titles, such as Agua Viva by Clarice Lispector, um, and others. <laughs> there goes my memory again. OK, so now uh, is the time to talk about uh, five of the books I mentioned. 
And uh, Cena uh, chose the categories with me very firmly in mind. She knew that the film adaptations one would uh, would needle me, <laughs> get me on my soapbox. And she also knew that my favourite type of writing is, is the experimental type. Uh, and I've talked about several of those books, uh, you know, uh, ad infinitum. So I'm not going to talk about um, the Ben Marcus or the David Markson because I've talked about them elsewhere. Uh, I won't talk about B.S. Johnson's The Unfortunates because Cena herself uh, talked about that book in her own video. Um, so uh, one I will talk about from this category, though, is uh, Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves. And uh, this is experimental in the sense that it has lots of different uh, sort of framing devices. Um, so that it opens up with... Um, discovered notes to uh, a documentary film which may or may not exist the notes exist but it's not clear that the documentary film was ever uh, it was ever in existence and, and it was a sort of an obsessive act by the guy making these notes because primarily this is a book about sort of um, schizophrenia and other sort of mental uh, conditions and uh, this uh, documentary film uh, links into uh, the House of Leeds itself, which is owned by a photojournalist who was travelling all around the world for his job and has come back to this house in America, I can't remember in which state, with his family, basically to save the marriage because he was away so often that, that you know, it put pressures on the marriage. But he discovers that the house is a bit like Doctor Who's TARDIS, that they're all these sort of it's bigger on the inside than on the outside. There's all these sort of secret passages and tunnels and, and, and sort of levels underground and stuff. And he resolves uh, to, to get to the bottom of it and sort of, you know, see, see what it really is. And that is the plot of the book. But why it's sort of experimental is because of its layout on the page. And you've got things like that. Things like that. Um things like that. I'll just show you one of the more sort of spatial ones. Sorry, those are spatial. One of the more geometrical ones. Things like that. And it's like that because, you know, and the text is sort of architectural like that because it's dealing with the architecture of this house which is ever changing but it's also about the architecture of the human mind uh, of you know someone with uh, sort of a mental illness and the, and the, the, the photojournalist who um, is going to explore his own house it becomes a manic obsession for him it's just a, a, a brilliant brilliant book and you know, I was so blown away by it that when I finished it, I went on to Goodreads and, and went to see what other people said, said about it, which I don't do very often, or in many cases of books. And lots of the comments there were responding to it as um, uh, a horror genre book or a supernatural genre book, neither of which ever entered my head that that's what this book was. To me, it was a work of high literary formalism. Uh, and it speaks to the success of the book that it can satisfy, you know, people on either end of, of, of you know, the genre or the, the sort of high literary. And, and neither of us would bat an, would bat an eyelid uh, at it. I just think it's a supreme, supreme achievement. So, you know, apart from Leaf, leaf by Leaf, and uh, Noah, everyone who reads Must Converse, I'm not aware of BookTube really talking about Daniel Lewski's other works. So a couple of years ago, I picked, picked this up called Only Revolutions. And while it maintains a consistent literary formalism, the content of the book was not giving me all that much. So out of the 301 pages, I'm on page 100. But I have, you know, and I put it down two years ago, and I have committed myself to finishing it this year but you know it's not as good I don't think it's going to be as good as House of Leaves. Okay uh, and on to comedy uh, for which I picked two books the first was uh, that I'm going to talk about is Philip Roth's uh, The Great American Novel which you know it seems to me that Americans have an obsession and maybe this is because you know it's a country that's only been around for uh, you know 240 years whatever it is um, 
it has an obsession with with you know uh, trying to find the great never the great American novel. And I think Roth, in a way, at least for one decade, the decade of the 60s, he wrote the great American novel of the 60s in the, in the form of American pastoral. And I don't know if uh, the great American novel, where it sits in relation to uh, American pastoral in terms of having been written before or after it, uh, if it was after, I do wonder if it's a comment on his achievement with, with American pastoral. But that's all you know, speculation. I haven't bothered doing any of the, the research. Uh, because uh, the great American novel by Philip Roth is a book about baseball, and, and it's almost a sort of you know, cocky a snooker. You know, this is the image that will summarise America: something as trivial uh, and yet as sort of deep in the bloodstream as as baseball. So the plot is: uh, it's wartime, Second World War, uh, a baseball team. So we're not talking the professional leagues; we're talking the next one, next level down. Um, a baseball team have lost their their stadium to uh, war production, so they are going on the road. Uh, a lot of their players have been called up to the army or taken into the the munitions industries, so they're calling back a lot of old former players who've retired and stuff. And the book is ostensibly this this one season of this team, you know, people with wooden legs and things like that, you know, bad eyesight and things like this. So there's a lot of comedy in it. But there's, there's a serious point because it's about sort of capital versus labour relations with the form of the owners uh, of the clubs and their sort of political machinations. Uh, also the sort of uh, the commercial aspect, capitalist aspect of selling tickets and the, and the sort of uh, lies and and sort of aspirational adverts and, and and marketing of of you know this this deadbeat team to get people into the stadium, but what's what's the real achievement is is the cast of characters that Roth manages so brilliantly, you know, it, 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 you know you've got you, as I say you've got the owners and the publicists and the marketeers and journalists. And all the players in the in the baseball um, ro roster, um, and he handle you know each one is is developed and given a personality and a character in the book that's of weight, and you know you care about them, but it is incredibly funny. That's the thing. I mean, there you know, I'm not going to go into it too much because I know a lot of viewers aren't either familiar with or interested in baseball. But there's you know there's this one scene where during a match you've got the ace pitcher who's this kid who respects nobody but he has a very very fast throwing hard throwing arm and he's like smashing all the records in the league and he's facing this batter uh who's sort of quaking in in the batter's box but behind the batter is where the umpire stands and this umpire is calling his pitches so tightly that that you know strikes become balls uh, and he, you know, he can't get this batter out, and they're having a the umpire and the and the pitcher on the mound are sort of having a shouting match because the pitcher is worried that the umpire's doing it deliberately to ruin his sort of his records and stuff. And it's a fantastically rendered scene that is tense and yet funny, um, and there's lots of that throughout the book. And gradually, what you realise towards the end of the book that this, you know, this notion of of the great American novel. This whole book is pointing towards the oncoming Cold War that will emerge straight out of the Second World War. It's it's a supreme work of of, of sort of mastery by Roth, uh, and not a book that you hear talked about a lot because everyone talks about American Pastoral, The Plot Against America, or the Jewish novels like Goodbye Columbus and Portnoy's Complaint, or the ones that get made into films like The Human Stain and things like that. This this for me is on an equal level to American Pastoral, which made my, you know, top ten uh, booktube novels when, when that tag was around. And the other book is Jared Kobeck, I Hate the Internet, uh, which just is laugh out loud funny on every page. Um, but it's not really a novel. I mean, it's called a novel. It's specified as a novel, but I mean, it, it isn't really. There, there are two main characters called Adelaine, and Baby. Baby is a sort of science fiction writer. And um, it's set in San Francisco in 2013, uh, when the whole world has sort of moved online, and it satirises 
uh, well, it doesn't satisfy, it just sort of points out and, and critiques, really, but in a very humorous way, you know, how free speech online is anything but free speech because A, it's not free because we're paying for it, um, sort of, you know, by, uh, you know, encouraging advertisers to get to, you know, on the basis of volume of traffic to pay Twitter and Facebook. Uh, so it's not free. We, we are subsidising uh, Twitter and Facebook. So, for example, whenever there's sort of death threats or anything like that, you know, rape threats and, and traffic goes up, you know, that's making money for Twitter and, and Facebook, you know, through, through, you know, basically illegal activity. Uh, and it's not free speech because minority groups get, you know, they get beaten down into silence because they get, you know, they get so attacked on, on these, these platforms. So it's about race, it's about gender, it's about capitalism, it's about gentrification because that's what was happening to San Francisco under the tech boom. And it just, it's about global capitalism, it's about American foreign policy, and it's about culture. It just nails everything supremely. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. The users of Black Twitter were supplying white people with effortless access to a body of language and thought which could be harvested and transformed into content on websites owned by white people. The managers of these websites were very interested in demonstrating affluency with black culture, but had little to no interest in hiring the people who lived it. Affluency with black culture would attract more advertisers. Actual black people would scare advertisers. Back in the good old days when white people wanted to steal culture, they actually had to, you know, like, spend time around black people. But in 2013, the story was very different. The iPhone had changed everything. And this one? So let's talk about a, a writer who's, going, who's gone to a, a, a writer's conference. Late in his visit, J. Karachinam would meet UC Adler Olsen, who had mastered the art of writing Scandinavian crime fiction, a subgenre in which squalid tales written by secular humanists reaffirm the Christian doctrine of original sin. See, that's what I mean. He did absolutely nails it. There is not a smarter satirist, cultural satirist, in literature today than Jared Kobeck, I believe. Although, I will say one thing. Hang on a minute. Unfortunately, Kobeck thought that uh, the two main characters here, Adeline and Baby, uh, justified a novel of their own called The Future Won't Be Long. And it's terrible. They don't. Stick to writing your non-novels, Jared. OK, so that's three of the five books. And before I, I talk about the other two books, I'm, I am going to rise to the bay to talk about film adaptation. So the, the five books I mentioned... Uh, Naked Lunch and uh, Tristan Shandy, although I haven't read Tristan Shandy in fairness, but they've both been called unfilmable. Uh, and to be honest, a book written, you know, in the 17th century or the 18th century, whenever it was, <laughs> is so far removed from the idea of film that, you know, it should remain the preserve of fiction, which is what I believe all all serious literary fiction books should, you know, they should have nothing to do with films. Films should, you know, come up with their own storylines. But anyway, and indeed, they did prove to be unfilmable because the way into uh, Tristram Shandy, uh, Steve Coogan uh, decided when he made the film Cock and Ball was to have two actors uh, and follow them around uh, where they were intending to uh, to stage Cock and Ball. And it's really about the lives of the two actors in the modern times, much more than Tristan Sandy. So in a way, it, it ducks the issue of the unfilmability of Tristan Sandy by not really filming it at all. And it's similar for um, Naked Lunch, which was also called unfilmable, because there they interject uh, the character of William Burroughs stroke William Lee, the author, into the story of Naked Lunch. So it sort of becomes meta. Um, and it doesn't, you know, apart from the fact they cast uh, Peter Weller, whose acting chops are that Robocop had more facial expression uh, than he himself without the mask. Um, it just doesn't work. And, it, you know, I'm not sure that Naked Lunch, which is not one of my favourite Burroughs books, but I'm not sure that holds together in a coherent fashion as a book. So, you know, the chances of it holding together as a film narrative are, are even less. Um, Atonement uh, also suffers from that in that Atonement is a book of three parts, uh, three divergent parts, and uh, I haven't seen the film, um, but they are so, those three parts are so different. So part one is a sort of aristocratic household with a secret love affair 
and the younger sister of, I think, the woman, uh, has to hold the weight of this um, secret in an otherwise very lonely, isolated life in this big house. And I found that all very unengaging. Then part two is is that uh, the, the the man in the relationship was called up into the British Army and is part of the retreat from Dunkirk. And it is a brilliant job that um, Ian McEwan does on describing uh, the, the the battle scene at Dunkirk because what's what film is much better at than than books normally is big panoramas big visual scenes because in a war uh you know if you're following just one character's viewpoint uh you get a very small section of the battlefield you don't know the fog of war literally clouds what else is going along there and McEwen overcomes that with a tremendous job of description and the film may well replicate that excellence I don't know I haven't seen it and then you have the third part which is a very short uh, part where the younger sister is now an adult she's a successful writer revisiting the the you know the past and this secret which felt to me at the time when I read the book to be a bit of a bolt on it, it wasn't really necessary it didn't add anything so I thought I would imagine that would make quite a strange film because it makes quite a strange book in that you know part one is <laughs> part two is like wow and then part three is utterly disposable so I'm not sure that that could work as a film. Life of Pi. Now, the whole point about Life of Pi is the switch in reality and perception. Um, so, and it's a mental, you know, it's a, it's a mental switch in the reader that the author's fed you. You can't replicate that in film, you know, and if you are, you're just, you're just going to cheapen it, really. So that doesn't work as an idea for me either. And as to Under the Skin, now I started watching Under the Skin on TV, uh, you know, when the, the film was put on TV. And I, I switched it off after about halfway through because they'd made it an utterly arty, uh, stylized version of what is a very powerful, tense novel. And they put this sort of stylistic gloss on it where, you know, instead of having sort of, I mean, parts of it were, the you know, Italy in her car on the roads in Scotland, but other parts were sort of blacked out stages with just sort of spotlights with her and, and her, you know, her man pray, you know, that, that she landed. And I just, I just thought if, if you're going to stylize it, you need to make a totally different film. You can't, you can't have bits of what Faber did and then introduce your own auteur bits. And I feel that's, you know, although I didn't mention this film, I feel that's the same with We Need to Talk About Kevin, which is another film which is highly stylized, um, with the sort of imagery of red flowers and blood and all this sort of stuff, where they become motifs in a way that they weren't in the book, or at least not that I remember. Um, so this is my problem with, with film screenplays of, of, you know, serious literary fiction. OK, on to the, the, the last two books. So um, in the uh, I didn't want to visit another time because I, I you know, I'm all about the here and now and the, the, the soon to be future. Uh, so I have no desire to visit other historical epochs, um, not least because you probably catch terrible, uh, you know, illnesses and there's no antibiotics. Although we're doing our best to go back to that stage by by denaturing our own antibiotic uh, sort of immunisation. Anyway, um, so I mentioned XX by Rian Hughes, which is a, a, a great book, and I, I've because I've read it recently, I'm not going to talk about it here. In fact, there are several books that I listed uh, in throughout this this challenge that I'll just post the links to the to, to, to the reviews. Little Scratch is another book I've read recently. So I'll just I'll just post it to those. So I'm going to books that I haven't read for uh, that I haven't read in the last year or so. So uh, one of those is um, Embassy Town by China Mielville. Now, I've never really understood what space opera is, and when I've asked people, they sort of said, oh, it's got a spaceship in it, yeah, and you follow the, the journey of the spaceship, which is certainly true of Embassy Town. It's a female pilot. Um, but that, you know, all of that stuff I I find very uninteresting. What What makes this book a cut above? is it's a wonderfully imaginative exploration of language and how language works and what William Burroughs called language as virus. So uh, there's an alien race on a planet and their language is, is sort of 
impenetrable unless you have two joined minds and these are called the ambassadors um, who were like sort of diplomats sent to this planet and when they link and become sort of two minds as one each brain can be applied to the two the sort of schizoid parts of the language of, of the hosts uh, species that they're dealing with so that the two ambassadors together can um, translate the language with each functioning to get you know half of, of of the language and they bring them together and that's what gives sort of legibility and understanding of the language and what there's a, a an ambassador pairing and one of them is killed uh, by by one of the hosts and this seems to presage you know sort of imminent collapse of relations between the two species but also it's testament to a rising virus in in the hosts whereby their language is changing and that threatens to uh, enable them to have revolution and overthrow what has up to them been a very peaceful and law-abiding species and it's just a brilliant sort of study of, of that there is all the spaceship stuff and all the tech stuff about that and you know, flying through warp speed. If that's what you're interested in, that's there as well. But, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with China Melville. I find a lot of his books I want to hurl across the room, but this is the one example where he manages to bring everything together in a wholly satisfying way because he's a genre writer, but he's also a literary writer of ideas. And here's the only example that I've read, admittedly I haven't read all of his oeuvre, where the two come together in a way that also actually... Um, sort of uh, involves you as a reader, engages your emotions, because most of his books, because they're about ideas in a genre setting, they don't really involve you as a reader, you just can appreciate the ideas or whatever. And the other book I'm going to talk about is Solaris by Stanislaw Lem. Uh, there have been two films made of it, uh, one with George Clooney, and the other is by the Russian master uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. I've seen the Tarkovsky and I've seen bits of the Clooney one. But, you know, forget the movies. And this isn't even a, a rip on movie adaptations. But the book is so good. It's only 120 pages long. It's not very, It's not a very long read. But basically, there are three, uh, three astronauts in orbit around a planet. And they are there to observe the planet. Uh, but the planet is, you know, rather than having life on the planet, the planet itself is alive. The planet has consciousness, has an awareness. And the planet is actually observing them as much as they are observing the planet. And what the planet is able to do, it's able to sort of mine their memories and cast projections from of things from their memory as if they were real and present on the spaceship. So these three astronauts are struggling with their memories being projected to them as if they are real and they're sort of having these hallucinations without them ever seeing as hallucinations. They see it as very real. Um, which, of course, is, is, you know, one aspect potentially of sort of schizophrenia and stuff. It's just a supremely well-rendered idea. Very simple and, and very, very brilliantly done. And turns the tables on the sort of human race's sort of assumption of it being, you know, at the centre of everything, including the centre of the universe. Um, so, yeah, there you have it. Thanks very much to both Zena and Scott and Nell at Gunpowder, Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. Um, till next time.